Hey gang, it's Rob with Japan Anime Games. I'm going to be teaching you today how to play Heart of Crown, deck building card game that you see here. It is for two to four players, playable in about 45 minutes, and it has two expansions that we'll be releasing with it as well. So let's begin. We're going to be covering four basic things today. We're going to be covering setup, your first two turns, and advanced play, and winning the game. And that'll pretty much take us to where you'll know how to play. So let's begin with setup. When you set up the board, you want to have your basic market, your random market, and your princess pile. Princess pile should have six princesses if you're just playing the base game, seven or eight, depending on how many expansions you're playing with. Your random market should have eight unique cards in the pile, as well as the uh, or eight unique sets of cards, sets of five. Uh, that's the way they come in the box. It'll be easy to figure out when you're looking at it. And you can pick pile uh, kind of random market preferences that they decide for you, or you can make your own by using a randomizer or just picking what cards you want to play with the most. I've started with basically the base set, which I'll include in the comments section. I really recommend it for your like first couple games because it gives you a kind of a wide selection of uh, gameplay mechanics and it can lead to some really really fun games it's probably actually my favorite way to play um, then you want to have your basic market basic market same every game uh, and basically you want to have your pile of senators your pile of dukes your pile of royal maids your curse pile city pile and large city then each player will have seven farming villages and three apprentice maids. We're going to shuffle this up and we're going to begin the procedure for the first two turns. But that's set up, essentially. Um, pretty simple, especially when you're using a Japan Anime Games playmat uh, that we have available at the site. It's really cool. I really like it. This is my kind of thing. I enjoy it. Uh, and uh, I don't know. I, I always have more fun when I'm playing with it. So I shuffle up my deck. Pop that right there. Deck face down. Discard face up. Keep your hand right here. Make sure you have a little bit of a play area because you will need it in this game. Now we have this pile right here. Hopefully I shuffled it good enough. I'm going to flip it over just because it makes life easier. And I'm going to deal out eight unique cards right here. Um, Any time that there's a duplicate, I add to the pile that the duplicate's in. So as you can see, City Development, Wishing Well, and Scout all have duplicates, so I deal into them. And once I have... A unique set of cards that's the start of my random market anytime one of these piles goes empty I refill in the same manner once again adding two piles that are duplicates you should never have two of the same card occupying two spaces it's very important okay uh, so that's our setup our first turn is beginning I draw five cards okay my five first cards are luckily five farming villages Okay, as you can see, farming village is up on the screen there. Let's kind of dissect the anatomy of three types of the three types of cards in the game, except for princess cards, but they're a little bit different. So, if you take a look, a farming village, as you can see up here on the screen, in the top left-hand corner, that is the cost of the card. That's how much it'll cost to purchase from the market, and that is also what is being referred to when certain cards say cost of the card. The on the left, it says Farming Village, that's the name of the card. And on the bottom left, it says Territory, and the card's border is brown. This makes it a Territory card. Territory cards can be um, added to a kingdom. They generally generate currency. I think they actually always generate currency. And uh, most of the time, they aren't found in the marketplace. Although there is always one, the Imperial Capital. But there are a few cards in the expansions that add more territories, and there's a few in the base game. But that's a Territory card. You can play those pretty much whenever as long as you have a golden triangle and that's the mechanic we're going to look at now see if you look to the right there's a little golden arrow um, or triangle as it is kind of looks like a triforce piece if you squished it and that determines whether or not you can make a play so let's say for example I play farming village okay I have a golden triangle so that means I may play farming village I have a golden triangle so on so forth but let's take a look at a few other cards. So I'm going to bring up right here. Let's say I had a trading ship in my hand. If you take a look, there's trading ship. Cost three, name, trading ship, 
action, parentheses, merchant. Select one of the following, draw two cards or two coins. Great little card. I mean, it's a three cost. And if we compare it to, say, another action card that's on the board, like Alchemist, five cost, action, draw two cards. It kind of looks like trading ships, the better deal, right? Except for, let's notice one key element. Trading ship is missing the, uh, the golden arrow or the golden triangle, the little Triforce piece. Alchemist is not. So that means you cannot play cards after you play trading ship. There are, of course, exceptions. And if we take a look here at the scout card, bring that up. It's two cost, scout, action, slash attack, parentheses, military. It, in addition to its ability, has two triforces or two golden bridges or two little triangles. Meaning that as long as you play the scout before the trading ship, you potentially can chain it. The way that that would look is you play the scout, you play the trading ship going down or going this way, depending on how you'd like to chain the go, and you can continue playing. In my opinion, uh, and this is purely subjective, this is one of my favorite mechanics in any deck builder ever. So let's get on with our first turn. Uh, there's a third type of card called Secession Cards. We're going to bring up real quick the uh, Royal Maid here. It's three costs, Royal Maid, Secession, Maid, and it has two little crowns. Goal of the game, reach 20 crowns. But until we have a princess, those cards don't do anything for us. So we're not even going to worry about them until we get a princess. So I go one, two, three, four, five. I have five gold because each of these generates one gold because it has a little gold piece, as you can see there. And I'm going to pick up that Alchemist that we talked about. So I pop the Alchemist up there. The five cards I played, as well as the card I purchased, they go into my discard pile face up. I draw five new cards, and then my turn ends. It's really important, guys. My turn ends with my hand for next turn in my hand. Because there are cards that other players can play that will attack my hand. My turn has ended. I now refill this pile i don't refill it immediately after buying i refill at the end of my turn we pass around everybody takes their first turn goes back to me i have three apprentice mains and as you can see there like i said they are secession cards so there is nothing that i can do with them at this moment so pretty much they're like an, a blank spot in my hand and i have two farming villages Play my two farming villages, and I will pick up a Wishing Well. You can see Wishing Well there on the screen. Good little action card. In the early game, you want to be filling your deck up with action cards and various uh, money. Because your goal is to back a princess. And that's what we're going to get to right now. I'm going to kind of fabricate a hand here. Don't let anyone know I'm cheating. This game will probably have an asterisk next to it. And I'm going to put three cities on top of my deck because I want to be able to purchase a new princess. So at the end of my second term when I played my five cards and I purchased the wishing well and I went to draw for my deck, there was nothing there. So I had to shuffle and create a new deck. I've created that new deck and this is what I'll draw from. This is why, if you're unfamiliar with deck builders, why it's called a deck builder. I draw five from the top with the three cards I cheated with, just so nobody gets confused. Oh look at that, I have three cities and two farming villages. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to play city, 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 okay, and I'll play the two farming villages just for the heck of it, and now I'm going to back a princess. I am going to choose the most basic and simple princess, although as you play the game, you will probably pick more complicated princess, the first princess, Lulu Nesca, okay, she is the eldest daughter of Emperor Hellard. She has, all she does is she gives you starting six succession points. Remember how I told you needed 20? So that means you need to get 14 more. She gets a little bit of a head start. You can see her up there on the screen. Cost six, she's a princess, bam. She now goes on top of these three cities and these three cities are removed from my deck. Basically, it should look like what I'm displaying here on the screen. This is now your kingdom. And the interesting thing about uh, Heart of Crown is once you have your princess, and by the way, 
It's the only princess you're going to get. You can't get a new princess to double up on the effects or change your mind. You're, you're locked into this princess for the rest of the game. Once you get this princess, you essentially get what I would refer to as a bank. So let's draw five cards here. And if I don't draw something I can bank, I'm going to cheat. I'm going to cheat. Boom. I've cheated. Boom. All right. So my hand is Alchemist, two farming villages, and an apprentice maid. Okay? As well as a wishing well. I don't want to use wishing well this turn. Okay? It costs two, as you can see on the screen. And because it costs two, that means I can store it under a city in my kingdom. Because you can store any card that's equal to or less than the cost of the territory you're storing it on. I may only store one card, and it just remains there. I play out the rest of my turn, do whatever I want, blah, blah, blah. These cards go to my discard pile. I draw five new cards, just like I would on any turn. Except the only difference is, I now have this wishing well sitting down here. Now, if I want to use it, I have to remove it from here, and I kind of lose it here. But I can hold on to it for as long as I want. And in interesting circumstances, say you had a Rampart, which I'm bringing up here on the screen. Rampart has a defense attack effect where if somebody tries to attack you, you can block naturally with your Rampart walls. I could store the Rampart card here on a city if I had it in my hand on a turn. And now whenever somebody tries to attack me, I just point to the Rampart and now I've blocked it. So it's a pretty interesting and kind of... Uh, cool way to add a, st a static element to a deck building card game. Now, let's talk about the final element of the game. Um, how do we win? How do we win? Well, what is the way that we win? We have our princess. We have six succession points to begin with. How do we win? The way that we do that is we pick up cards like the Duke, which you can see here on the screen, or the Senator. The Duke cost eight, is a succession card, and has six crowns. What this basically means is, say I had a turn in which I had a duke and a senator. I could, at the end of my play phase, say, all right, end of my play phase, instead of buying, I am going to secede cards. And I am going to secede the duke and the senator. I can secede as many cards as I want. So say I wanted to secede these apprentice maids, I could also secede them. But if you look here, apprentice maids have a negative secession value. Which kind of means if you want them out of your deck, you're going to have to kind of set yourself back on the race uh, for secession. Not that that's necessarily a bad idea. But anyway, I would take these cards. I'd put them next to the princess just in some way so that we're aware. And I would now be sitting at 15 secession. Six from the duke, three from the senator, and six from Princess Lulunesca. And what this basically means is I am now five away from potentially winning the game. So let's do that. I secede here. I now am at 21 points. Technically, I win the game. Every other player now gets one additional turn to try and win uh, once I hit 20. Uh, and basically, if they do reach 20 as well, we now would go to sudden death. First player to hit 30 instantly wins. In addition, first player to hit 30 always wins. That just always happens. It absolutely always happens. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically how you, the four steps to playing a, a Heart of Crown game. Just to review, in the beginning we went over setup. And the second part, we went over the card types, terrain, secession, and action. And uh, we went over how plays work using the golden triangles. Uh, we went over how backing a princess works. Um, where you take the first three cards that you back to your princess and they become your, your, your kingdom. We talked about how to store cards on our kingdom. We talked about how to purchase cards, how to shuffle our deck, how all of that works. And we talked about winning the game. Uh, that is essentially how to play from there. Uh, the game's a lot of fun. There's a lot that can go on in it. There's a lot of interesting interactions and cool things. And I, I really recommend you give it a shot. The game is available at uh, JapanimeGames.com uh, this June, and we have a number of expansions coming out as well. Far Eastern Territory will be coming out in August, so look forward to that, guys. It's really exciting. And yeah, that is Heart of Crown, deck-building card game. It's my favorite game. I really love it. I've actually 
kind of play it on stream because there's a Steam version of the game as well that we'll be releasing. I have the early access to it. Uh, it's unfortunately in Japanese, but I have all the cards memorized, so it doesn't bother me much. And um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I really, really, really recommend it. Even if you're not a fan of deck builders ordinarily, I think the mixture of art style plus gameplay, uh, fantastic winning combo. But yeah, guys, if you have any questions, leave a comment at the bottom of the video or shoot me an email at info at japanimegames.com. Uh, this has been Rob with Japanime. Uh, and yeah, thanks for watching, guys. Have a good one. I'll see you, uh, I'll see you in the next video.